refresh to everybody. Yeah. I will show you here, uh, and you can see without approaching uh, here, uh, it, these are a danger, uh, endangered areas of the manuscript. Yeah, you see? And you know from where it comes? If you open the book in a too big angle, you will break the links here between the spine and the cover plates. That's always a neurologic uh, spot in a book. It's endangered, always. So please be careful not to open a book, a historical book, too wide. Uh, you may cause damages or do uh, additional harm to a very sensitive object. And if we are reading a book or in such a kind of book, I would like to invite you not to read with the finger on the text. <laughs> yeah. We, 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 have, uh, we, we, are, we are used to do it from school times, I know it. And it's quite clear, I am I'm having my, my, my digit here and right, putting the text in the computer there. So it is, it is quite normal. If we are doing so, we would uh, damage the script or so. Uh, and you might ask why we are not using uh, white gloves. It's a philosophy, actually, it's a philosophy. If you are using white gloves, it is very dangerous, believe it to me. Since normally you are used to touch a book with your fingers, and this has a certain, a certain, uh, it fixes the object in your hand. Yeah? If you have gloves, it is, it is uh, becoming, uh, it's getting slippery. And we have had it. In Austin National Library, there was a, a performance with Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah, it's an Austrian, yeah? yeah, from yeah. The <laughs> and he was, he was invited there by the, by the director before camera, uh, in front of camera, uh, uh, to, 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 to handle with a book, with a historical book, or was it a document? And he got uh, white gloves, uh, gloves and uh, he, he, he received it. And in that moment, he, he got it. It escaped and fell down to the bottom. So it is very ambivalent. Normally, we are uh, not using gloves, but in some cases we do. If we are dealing with, with metals, and uh, it is sweety, uh, hands are, uh, so it would cause uh, chemic, chemic reactions uh, on metals, so that's it. And therefore, in, in such very specific cases, you, we, have to, we have to be careful. That's it. Okay, uh, just to remind you, here we have a book with a very interesting book cover. You can even describe and encode book shoes if you want, <laughs> and boxes of any kind. So if you really want, uh, there, are, there are possibilities to do that. You can describe even the spine here. This pin, this pin, and the buckles, and the decoration of the leather, and the binding, and the hand, uh, the, the, the headband, and, the, and so on, and so on, and so on. Everything you can encode. So the totality of a reality of a book, which is a very complex uh, affair, and it is not only text, please, text is only one reality, of course, an important uh, reality, uh, of a book. But the book itself is a rich, rich complexity. And you will see it again uh, uh, with the next object I will present to you. This is the number 32. It's not necessary to keep in mind the numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, as you have already detected, we have this manuscript two times in this room. One in a form, uh, in a depicted form, here, with one of the previous heads of this uh, special collections department. And 
and I do not know why, uh, why uh, Schretner uh, took this uh, book as his most possibly most beloved uh, preferred uh, example of, of, of all the books we have here. But it is a wonderful book again. We are in the 14th century. That's a much copied book and a, a book of much interest. It very much used. It is a legal book, a juridical book. Actually, the book, the contents of the book, transfers the contents of lawmaking from antiquity to modernity. It's Roman law. The Codex Justinianus, which itself is based on the Codex Theodosianus, uh, uh, is transferred here. You can easily identify the book without having read even one line through the layout. The layout, the mise en page of this book is so specific and so characteristic that you may this, uh, easily say, okay, that's a juridical book. Why? And you have a reality to encode. It's the layout here, with, with, since it is so characteristic, but it's difficult. You have two columns of main text, written in a bigger size than the rest of the text. Clear. So, we have the central text, the core text. That's the text of the law. Then we have columns around, uh, surrounding these text blocks, which is of two columns as well. This layout in that form gives it information this is a juridical book. I do not have knowledge of any other uh, manuscript with this layout not being a juridical book. Additionally, you have many remarks on the margins, more or, or less comprehensive, small paragraphs and longer paragraphs, Here, for example, on the margins, it is difficult to encode them. And it is more difficult to read them. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, in some cases, um, impossible to read them, since uh, you can see uh, the margins of this book has, have been trimmed. This gives us the historic information about the book. This is a rebound book. You have to cut, uh, if the margins are cut, it is rebound in normal situation, otherwise it wouldn't make sense to... Uh, so it is for protective, for conser conservatory purposes that they did so. But we are losing text, we are losing information. But what text do we have here? These are additional interpretations of how one this or that passage could be understood. That's like in our days. That's the normal text of law. In, in Austria we would say Allgemeines Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch. That's the common law book here, the rules, general rules. These are the outside, these are uh, the surrounding text, a little bit smaller, are um, the common interpretations. And this Additional remarks give us information of how to further understanding uh, of how passages would be understood uh, uh, in an actualized way. And this is how law is growing. Uh, you have a law which gives you general information. You have an interpretation which is official. So, Allgemeines Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch and then Ergänzungsblätter, additional uh, leaves which give a formal interpretation. But at a certain point, this is not enough. And this is how a book uh, is keeping law alive. And this is documented here. You can see what are the problems, where are the problems, what was... And this book was in use, in frequent use. And if you read it, it is so difficult. Why is it difficult? The Latin language which is used here is not that difficult. It's, it's a juridical language. If you know the, the vocabulary, it's okay. You, but you have to learn every vocabulary of a, of a specific area, of a specific content. That's not the question. The point is, there are so many abbreviations. 
so many abbreviations and it will take you much time to find the key to all these uh, for encoding if you want to encode or are used to encode even the, the number of lines of a book of a, of a folium of one page it's difficult here huh? you have at least two systems regular systems with different line numbers so you have two uh, realities on one page and if you uh, uh, would like to add the glosse the marginal notes then uh, you will have an ad ad additional problem but you have some sometimes you have uh, to include them on the margin you will not have uh, modern interpretations of the old stuff here but sometimes you will have corrections sometimes you will have uh, an omitted word or uh, what else uh, will be here supplied you have to include this reality of what is on the margins from time to time uh, uh, in your encoding and we know it from the from the Novak miss uh, from the Knes Novak uh, missile that, that, that this, uh, it's not that much what you will find on the margin there as we have here but it's always a task you have to come up with this it is common it gives us the information okay this is a vivid text people were reading the text and they were living and working with the text and this is uh, perceivable here and you can encode this reality as belonging to the book it's clear of course you can uh, we, we know already we cannot encode all realities we are perceiving in a, with a book so it is our decision what we want to encode now what are the realities we want or we need from the very first moment and which ones could be possibly added, added at a later time, at a later date. Yeah? So the richness of encoding is, among others, that we can add additional information and encoding another layer we, which we find, uh, of information we find in a book at a certain time, whenever we want. So, if I not, if I am not uh, uh, coming to an end with my encoding initiative of, let's say, all all uh, liturgical books in middle middle Europe, I can die with uh, peacefully, since I know others can continue, or they may encode additional realities. Actually, you can encode every single word. You can make out, uh, uh, we can, you can make a dictionary of any book you are finding. You can, you can encode even, even uh, uh, the word uh, linguistically. Putting this together, you have a vocabulary of a book and then uh, a dictionary. <laughs> what makes it difficult is if you have such texts. You are not alone and you are not the first one to have such a text. If you find a, another text which is already published, which is already online, you may re reference it. You may link this text pass passage to any existing text uh, on the web, which is already existing online. It would be helpful, for example, with biblical texts. If you have a biblical quote, let us compare it to the text which is already online, if it is a standard text, of course. It must be a permanent standardized text which is permanent, uh, permanently available, otherwise referencing has no, uh, no, no, no sense. And you will discover, whenever you are referencing, there are variants in your object. So you have to find out where are the variants. In normal cases, the person who has the task to encode a book or a text must have a knowledge of the contents, otherwise you cannot do essential things. 
But you see, it is, it, is, it, is, it is not that simple. Of course, you can do it. And if you do not referencing work, uh, uh, then, then it's okay as well. And you can do it or uh, can rely on it. Uh, anybody uh, will do it at a later stage. I don't know. So you see some challenges here with this very wonderful object. It comes here so simply with so wonderful uh, illuminations. Apropos illuminations, how do we encode illuminations? We have a variety of different types. We have drolleries, we have, we have uh, ca um, capital letters, initial letters, initial passages, and so on. With a different, We have to learn, it's one of the biggest tasks, we have to learn what to encode, how is there a systematic, a hierarchy of, of, of illuminations in the text, which gives the text a structure. We have pictures, we have illuminations, we have capital letters, we have capital letters with the core, and, 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 and. So, is this a system? If we have this system, then we can see possibly there is a system behind it and we have to encode it accordingly. But it's difficult to find out. And, no, and in many cases it's not logic throughout. <laughs> so, but how do we handle this reality? Okay? And abbreviations, I mentioned it, uh, it's difficult to see, but I, I could add here, uh, uh, to, 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 to deal with abbreviations is very, 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 very it's, it's delicious sometimes. <laughs> For example, in our uh, Novak missile, we have, we have thousand times, we have the word uh, God or, or uh, uh, other words which are very common and they are uh, abbreviated. And sometimes with the first letter, then with the, th uh, with the last letter, and, 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 and. So, does it really make much sense to do it in the most compli uh, complex ways? So, we have to make decisions. And this is a really, really hard reality. Whenever you are encoding, we know it, all of us, we know it by experience. We have always to make decisions. And if we are deciding that we are dealing with abbreviations or any reality we are encoding in this way, let us document it. That others, others who may continue know what we have done and why we have done what. Please, it's very, very important, but we have to make our decisions. It's always the situation we have to make decisions when we are in code. What and how and how we do what and why. Yeah, okay. Thank you for being attentive. I'm not, I've not finished. <laughs> not yet finished. This is a fantastic manuscript. We'll be coming back to it. It's got just so much fine detail that rewards repeated investigation because it is both a incredibly deluxe manuscript, but one that obviously shows that it uh, received a lot of actual day-to-day -day use, which uh, is not always the case when we look at these fine copies that uh, are especially beloved by art museums and collections. I have two objects for you, and I'm continuing chronologically. No, no, it's not necessary. It's one book. Paper book, no. Oh, it's a wrong book. Oh. <laughs> I took the wrong one. I took the wrong one. I'm very sorry for it. But possibly tomorrow I will show you the other one. It was meant to uh, present you number 48. I took number one. It's of similar size. <laughs> Shit. I forgot. So, anyhow. <laughs> Excuse me, Sandra. Excuse me, I did not consider it. <laughs> and that's running camera. 
What we have here is a very huge book. It's not a pocket book, as you can see. You may come here. And you may even come here. And then you find out where it is written in that, uh, where the book is of that size. You can read the text even from two meters. This was the reason for it. It's a chant book. It's a chant book. And chant books uh, were of huge size since there was a pulpit in the midst of the choir. And on both sides, one book, and the monks were, were standing or sitting uh, at the side and facing these books, and from two meters they could see and could, could follow the text. This is why they produced such huge books. You can imagine that such books are very, very expensive. Very expensive, since you need much material, parchment. And you can produce a bifolium, so two folios, a bifolium out of one sheep, for example. So that's costly. In normal cases, that's very expensive. And uh, if you have to pay, you have to pay not only the material, but the execution of the script and the illuminations here as well. And in many cases, it was, not, uh, it was another person who was, who was carrying out the illuminations and who was writing. And sometimes it was another person who uh, made the design so the lines, for example, the lining and pricking and all these realities. So when you are describing a manuscript, you can describe even the pricking. You can describe and make mention of the holes which you find uh, on the margins uh, of, 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 a, of a page, which served for lining, just uh, uh, making the lines, that you have a stable standard layout throughout the book. If you do not encode this reality, it's okay. But if you have lacune, if you have uh, folios missing or choirs missing and rebound and you would not discover it, such information which you encode would help you one day to identify that one folio from the Library of Congress uh, 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 is, is fitting in here. So the more detailed information you give in describing codicologically the book will enrich the chances that you finally can identify a missing folio somewhere and you can succeed. You cannot, uh, you cannot imagine what, uh, what we succeeded in three years ago, two and a half years ago in summer. We discovered, a friend and me, uh, Efren, mm -hmm. he is in Yale now, uh, we uh, could identify a Syriac fragment of that size, of that size, parchment from the 6th century, which is nowadays in Yerevan, in Armenia, so Caucasus region, to identify this fragment as missing in a British library manuscript of the 6th century. So it is, it is wonderful, but you have to give, give substantial information which allows you to identify uh, any object sufficiently that you can do this work, otherwise you will not succeed in. And from time to time you will, uh, you will have your, 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 your success. It's not a guarantee, but it's a hope. And glad are those persons who, uh, who will, uh, will uh, see such, such, an early, uh, such a good morning. <laughs> For our purposes, too, about digitizing the materiality of the book, you know, he invited you to stand back because it is so readable. But I would also like you to think, when you are looking at this, the way we look at so many books now, in digital images or on a website, how would you know, or in this sense, how would you convey to your user the size of this book, right? Because this book could appear next to a pocket book on a website, 
and they would be fit into the same size window and the relationship between the size of the text to the size of the page could be very similar and actually one of the reasons I requested can we just get one of the largest books you had is because I wanted to make this point that when we're talking about digitizing the period out of the book the moment he opened that up and said that's one book you all went like immediately like that is a big book but I just want you to think about the ways that what we're digitizing things we're often making features like this completely invisible and so how would we think about making those visible and some libraries of course always include a target of a known size in every image that's one possible way to do it um, and of course we encode the dimensions of it but is it immediately apparent when you're looking at a book you know what the dimensions mean you know especially if you're putting it in inches for one audience and centimeters for another audience and they have to go look like is that a big book or a small book I don't know you know so um, as we're going through uh, really think about when we're talking about digitizing the material of the book what is immediately visible in the material book that is possibly invisible in the digital book and how can we think about making that uh, more apparent to our users um, so I, I love it for exactly this reason because again I think if you looked at that on image you have no sense that it was not handheld To realities which you may perceive it's by ch open by chance at this place here. Yeah, well, you, you may perceive or not these things which indicate uh, the beginning of a, of a section of, in a book. Yeah? And here we have a wonderful designed el el elimination uh, uh, initial letter. If you're an expert in, in, in music you may, all, uh, you may additionally uh, encode the musical system of notation. You can see here we have a, a system of, of based on four lines. It's not the five line system which we have now. So you may give, give information on such realities as well. So it's metatextual. It's not reading the text. And when I told you uh, that I have two features here we have a sign here as well, it's a number. It's a choir number. It's a choir number. How are we dealing with choir numbers which occur uh, possibly on all uh, 10th or 12th or 16th uh, pages? How do we enc uh, encode it? Is it necessary to do it or not? For the student, for the cataloger, for any uh, person who is dealing with such a manuscript in a comprehensive way, we have to be aware of uh, such signs, choir signs or choir numbers, whatever it is, in order to find out the totality of book, the inventory of the book. Are oh, there folios missing? We can study the structure of the book and one substantial help to do this and to verify it are the choir numbers and to study the choirs. Are there folios missing? I have 88888 and 78887. Okay, here's something. Uh, here happened something. Might be historically. It's not necessarily in, uh, the, the case that, that there is a folio missing. Possibly it was at the beginning so and they are uh, pasted together in the, in the gutter somewhere. Might be the case, but we have to find out and we have to explain why the number is of that kind or not. It's number one. <laughs> and again with the, uh, with the book cover. It is very difficult. Is that the typical way to store a book that large? Like sort of a blanket around it? Is that the typical way to store a book that large? Like sort of a blanket around it? 
typical way to store a book that long? Like well, it's one way of how to protect it, but it's not the ultimate way. Uh, what is a huge, a big advantage here is that you can carry it. It's simply a question of how to transport it without harm, doing harm to books. Uh, it's, a, it's a big danger to grab it, <laughs> since it has at least 30 kilos. At least, but uh, possibly a little bit more. So, one final object for this introduction for you this day. It is something completely different. But a curious object again, and uh, very difficult to encode, I can tell you. It's uh, a little bit a maximum. It's a crazy book. This book, it is not known that there would exist another copy of such a type of book worldwide. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's unique, really unique. It's not, it's not valuable from the material point of view. So it's not even it's paper. Some, pa uh, some, some uh, layers of paper are pasted together and that's the cover. And the binding is weak and feeble and it has to be stabilized. And the pagination is uh, completely wrong, so it's, it's in the running in the wrong direction. So, okay. <laughs> By the way, I have discovered, I have uh, seen many, many, uh, many, not only one, many manuscripts which have uh, up to seven different types of counting pages or folios, up to seven. And none of them, in some cases, can be harmonized. So. What, what information does it give, uh, give us to us? We have to stick to one counting of numbers, so we have to refer to pages. If you are coding, uh, encoding a uh, current text, you have to refer to a numbering system. But what, uh, what if, the num if any number in the system which you are encountering is not, is not uh, uh, clear, or has its mistakes, or lacunae? So, it is book archaeology. So again, we have to make a decision. What is the predominant system of counting pages? Are these folios which are counted? Are the pages which are counted? And what, what is most reliable? And we have to refer to it uh, when, when we are encoding a, a simple text column. And here we have a wrong pagination, since it's uh, paginated by a librarian according to the Western tradition from left to right. But actually it's a book from right to left. It's a Syriac dictionary, a Syriac Latin dictionary, the only Syriac manuscript we have in our collection. But it is a wonderful book. You can see it. Never. You, I guess you haven't seen it, something of that kind before. We have three columns of text. One, two, three, one, two, three. The middle column normally is left free. You are from Kerala. Yes. Are you Syriac speaking? No, no. No, no. But I, I know Istvan. Yeah. Istvan person. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he Do you know a Siri? Said Ephraim, a uh, commandical research uh, institute. They are there uh, doing Syriac studies there as well. But there is a Syriac Malayalam. That yeah, Malayalam. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you are reading Malayalam? Yeah. Oh. I'm not, <laughs> unfortunately. So, what we have here is an is a, is a interesting object, of course. 
not not because I love it, since it is really interesting. We have here an, uh, a dictionary of an Oriental languages, which is uh, written from right to left, according to the Syriac alphabet. We have here a dictionary of 8,000 words. Think about encoding a dictionary. How can we encode a dictionary? It is a wonderful task. I know a friend in Yerevan who is doing such works, but not with right to left from left to right. It's easier. But here we have a Syriac and Latin. Evidently, in the 18th century, it's an 18th century book, which, which was probably, or with high pos uh, highest probability, uh, produced here in Graz by a Jesuit professor from the Jesuit faculty. It was a theological faculty. Uh, this uh, university, Graz, at the beginning was a theological faculty, out of which uh, emerged this, this, this university here. So, this person, we do not know the name, was obviously uh, urged to have a dictionary of a language he knew or he was working with, possibly for himself uh, or for students, together with students, we do not know it, but this uh, sounds a little bit more, uh, he made his book uh, for the purpose of, of, of teaching. Uh, so what did he do? How can you produce, the question is, how can you produce a dictionary in the 18th century according to uh, the, 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 the Syriac alphabet? 8,000 words. Can you imagine how much that is? 8,000 words. If you know from any language you are learning, foreign language you are learning, 8,000 words, you know quite a lot. You can express everything, really, everything, with 8,000 words. That's, that's a huge scale of, of, of words you might uh, uh, learn or know. So, we have a very stereotypic page layout. Hmm? Three columns. What did he do? What did this person do? In the process of translating, he made a list of words and another list of words. He made stripes of paper where he put his entries with a broad pen for the Syriac word, the catch word, and with uh, uh, and, 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 and another fine pen uh, for the Latin uh, uh, equivalent. So, that's clear. Stripes, hundreds of stripes, and then at a certain point he had such a pile of stripes. Yeah? And he arranged them alphabetically. We have in Zurich, we have 22, 22 uh, uh, letters, so we have 22 piles of stripes. Olaf, Pet, Komal, Dolet, etc. ABC. At a certain point, this person cut after every single entry these stripes and arranged them alphabetically. All A's from A to according to the alphabet. This is why. And, and what he, how did he continue? He made an empty book of uh, uh, blank paper sheets, folded them, and designed three columns here with a pencil in red color. I know what he has read. I saw this, this uh, red color in a polyglot. And so I discovered what he did read. <laughs> it was a biblical polyglot. Biblia, uh, uh, you know the poly, uh, uh, the Madrid, Madrid, uh, Blutense, uh, 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 six uh, language Bible with Arabic, Samaritan, uh, Syriac, and so on, and Hebrew and Greek and Latin. So, and he. Uh, wrote out all these, arranged them alphabetically, and into the empty book he pasted every single word according to the Syriac alphabet. The middle column was left free 
for later entries. During the further process of translating texts, he might find other words which, we would, which he would have to, uh, to enter here and there, uh, in between somewhere. He made a cross or any sign and pasted it in here. And this was how he produced his own dictionary. Very practical, giving nearly no grammatical information. It's just a word list with according, uh, uh, with, um, with a according uh, uh, Latin expressions. So that's it. And nearly no uh, grammatical information. Normally you would expect masculine, feminine, or in, in Syriac it would be relevant is it the status absolutus or the status constructus or something of this, uh, these, these grammatical features, which are essential. Nothing of it. Really no, nearly no information. I could identify what, uh, what he read, what he read most, and so on. So it was very interesting to find out the making of this book. This is the interesting thing. And if you are going to encode it, we have here a very, very, uh, uh, more or less, well, we have, a, we have a standard layout, but it is transgressed always, really always. So you have, uh, at a certain point, you have uh, added, other pieces which were glued in, pasted in, and sometimes not pasted in, but at, at, the, at the end written with, uh, directly on the paper with, 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 with pen and so on. So but to, to encode this is uh, again a difficult uh, uh, task since you have no irregularities. So when it comes to the margins, for example, you cannot describe it. So it makes no sense. Every, every, uh, every, every page is actually changing. Difficult. So, the more regular a book is, the, the easier it is for us to describe it in any way. In any way. And at the end, and it's my final point. Wrong. At the end, we have something which is, which is completely useless. Uh, fully useless. I have, I have seen uh, hundreds of manuscripts, of Zurich manuscripts in this case, this person produced a system of writing numbers, numerals, with uh, Syriac characters. And you cannot, uh, I can tell you, he was able, he was able to write, to write, uh, four and ten, uh, the number four and ten zeros with one, two, three, four signs. And he built up a full system, a full system of writing from one to these high numbers. Nobody would ever need them. Nobody would ever need them. Really nobody. You will not find them, uh, uh, these numbers in any Syriac manuscript as far as I have seen. It is not expectable since the thinking is a Western thinking, and the Eastern thinking from where Syriac as a language would, uh, would have uh, emerged is completely different. They are not counting, they are saying one, two, three thousand, five thousand, uh, ten thousand, and, uh, un, uh, and, and then it's, it's no, no, no precise numbers, but just more and more and more, and much and much and much, and the superlative of the superlative, and so on. But they are not giving numbers, and you will not find them. The system he invented here, it's just a training, it's an exercise. And from the conservative point of view, uh, this is a damaged paper due to ink corrosion. You know the problem of ink corrosion? I do not think that we have another manuscript in our collection which is uh, damaged by ink corrosion. Ink corrosion is a chemical reaction of the acidity of uh, ink and paper. 
So it's a chemical reaction, and it is you can you can stop it with uh, with, with some means, but you cannot uh, uh, actually repair it. And exactly at those uh, places where we have ink, corrosion is there. So it is quite clear. You can uh, look through the paper, but only in the last choir of this manuscript, possibly this person used another ink or a different kind of paper, which caused this uh, chemical reaction destroying the uh, the material. And this is this is really a very frequent uh, feature. Uh, when we have uh, cheap papers which are not of, 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 of high value. So, try to encode this manuscript. It is very difficult. And if you want to encode the, the binding, then uh, you can easily see that's hard to be done, since it is, it is not done by a, a professional hand. It's more... <laughs> you know the tragedy? of this book. At the time when the person produced this book, a Latin, uh, a Syriac Latin dictionary was already printed on the market and available on the market. So, but not here in Graz, <laughs> evidently. But it, it was already existing in, in a number of copies, so, uh, but not here. But it is wonderful when we are studying such uh, books we are really close to the daily reality of a, of a scientist who made a book for possibly or probably didactic purposes. It is simply great. But it, is, uh, it has such uh, individual traits that, uh, that it's difficult and you should not start to encode uh, 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 books with such a, a complex object. It, it would not be... Uh, <laughs> it would, uh, wouldn't encourage you to do more. <laughs> so I thank you for the moment uh, for being uh, attentive and I'm, I'm apologizing for not having you presented uh, manuscript number 48, which have been a very richly uh, illuminated uh, with much, much gold uh, manuscript. And the, the curiosity or the specificity of that manuscript number 48 would have been it has been coped, the text has been taken from an already printed book. And the question is, why do one, why does one uh, 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 copy by hand an already printed text? And I can tell you, for representative purposes, to make you distinguish from, from the others who can just afford cheap things and cheap books. That's for, for the plebs and not for the nobility, as it was the case there. And uh, here again, you would have the, uh, there again, you would have the problem of referencing. You have an already printed text and you can refer, reference to the printed, it was printed in you can imagine uh, the, the, the text was printed in 1466 in, in Strasbourg uh, by Mentelin. That was, was the name of the printer. And three years later, this book, number 48, was accomplished after a two years period of coping. Two years. But of this, of this uh, size and uh, volume. And it is a Bible, the Bible text in German. You would have, possibly, who is German reading, I do not know, uh, would, would be able to understand the text, even if, even if it's an ancient uh, version of, our, of, of this language and a, uh, and a certain dialect of the region of, the, uh, of Strasbourg. But what is interesting, too, if you have this referencing system uh, of the printed book, you will discover variants. Textual variants. So that's the beginning, actually, of a, of, a, of a critical edition. And it is one of the features you can do in TI when you are encoding text. You can be really uh, produce a critical edition. And just a final remark. These 
uh, German text uh, of the uh, number 48 was uh, on the market uh, some 70 years before Martin Luther has accomplished his uh, uh, translation of the biblical text into German. I thank you for being attentive and uh, expecting your questions. Well, but if, if you have a question, please, I'm, I'm at your disposition. No question. Um, I was wondering um, to what extent copy specific aspects of books uh, such as marginalia are included in the base catalogue records uh, here. And uh, what shall I tell you? Can you repeat the question or make it more precise? Possibly uh, I didn't understand it correctly. In the, uh, in the digital catalogue for the library, to what yeah. extent are copy-specific aspects of works, early books, uh, such as marginalia, included in the catalogue entry? The catalogue, uh, the catalogue uh, which is online, has been uh, produced in the 1940s and 50s. And it, uh, it represents the state of art of what would be described, uh, what would be described at that time. And uh, it was uh, predominantly, it was uh, uh, the contents. We do not have, we do only have very, very scarce information on metatextual realities, so on codicological questions, for example. So we will, will not learn about uh, how many times this book was already copied, or, uh, except in those cases when the uh, writer of the catalogue knew it. Then we have from time to time an information, but it's only in, uh, in, in very uh, seldom cases. It's, it's about uh, nearly 100 years when the material of the uh, catalogue has been elaborated. And it is quite clear, uh, we are uh, far farther uh, in, in, in this, uh, in this day nowadays. And we would describe much more, especially in codicology. So uh, the integrity of the book to describe it would be very, very, very helpful, and we will uh, will not have all uh, find all in, uh, information in, in in the current catalog which is online. But it gives you substantial information on on main things. But we are working over years have been working on a new catalog. And here we had to learn, we cannot describe everything what we think would be necessary and needy. Otherwise, you will not come to an end. It is always the question, and there's a compromise. Uh, how much could, can you do in, let's say, 10 years? And after 10 or 15 years, the project should be done. If not, you have made a mistake. The catalogue is a catalogue which should give you uh, certain answers as to what is in the catalogue, uh, what is in a book. Of course, you can discuss it, what has to be uh, written in a catalogue, but uh, uh, you cannot write down everything and you cannot my, uh, make a scientific uh, article on all catalog entries, and this would be necessary. Only considering the binding and the book covers and its decoration would be sufficient for a full catalog without mentioning a word of contents. And you could fill your days here. And, uh, well, in total we are 12 or 13 people here in our uh, department and we have no chance to ever finish anything. <laughs> no chance at all. No chance at all. And encoding initiative uh, would, uh, uh, would facilitate uh, uh, our life in that sense that others may continue where we have started. And therefore, documentation is, 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 is elementary. Well, even there, there are all kinds of different levels of encoding as we are yes. going to talk about MS description, which we have a dedicated module for is essentially catalog description, 
whereas some of the other modules you're going to be talking about are more interested in transcription or in actual semantic analysis. I'm sorry, I realized that because of the format, some people have not been able to look at the books very closely. Uh, 1 and 32 are suitable for handling. As he says, don't touch the text. You can just look at this one, but I wanted to open it up to the page where he has realized that he missed one of the columns of text for the paste down, and so it has been inserted later, which of course is the kind of challenge when cataloging that you just write. There is an insert in between these uh, pages, but uh, when you have to specify it, because you have written yourself a very set of a strict set of rules for the digital catalog, it is the kind of thing that long discussions are made of to solve one minor issue. So I, I really like that it is there. So again, just this one's for looking at. You are welcome to handle these with care. And please come up and uh, we'll take uh, further questions. And Megan's presentation will start at 20 past the hour. So.